News is just reruns. It's like summer reruns or winter reruns or spring reruns or fall reruns. It doesn't matter. It's just reruns. It's the same thing over and over and over again, which of course is exactly what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to have a reality check this morning. Because that's really what a State of the Union address is. It's a reality check. Anybody who believes a State of the Union address needs a reality check. Because first of all, politicians lie. You can't be a politician without lying. You can't get into office without lying. I'm not going to back any of this up with any kind of references. If you don't know this, why are you listening to this? What are you doing here? If you don't already know this, then you're not dissatisfied with the State of the Union. And I don't mean the union of the United States. I mean the union of the world. If you're not dissatisfied with the union of the world, then you're still believing in life. And if you still believe in life, this work is not for you. This work is not for people who still believe in life. Now, you can be in life and be very good in life, be very good in life, but you don't really believe in it. You have ceased believing that it will give you what you need, what you crave. It will fill the desire of your heart. The hypnotism of life, our imagination and the law of seven ensures that we will live in circles, that we will come here again. What does that mean? It means just what I said, that news is reruns. We will do it again. History repeats itself. We will do it again. Many people feel today that everything will soon be better. We have the United Nations. We have the peace talks in the Middle East. We have this. We have that. We got rid of Saddam Hussein. We got rid of this. We got rid of that. Now we're working on this, and we're going to have this fixed. And now we have open relations with China. Communist Russia is fallen. And so things are really on the up. They're looking up. It's a, it's a positive upward move. You know, now our borders are safe. And we don't have any terrorist attacks here in the United States. So everything really is looking up. To a lot of people, this is the way they look at things. That progress is inevitable. That peace, prosperity, and happiness will, at some time, in time, reign on Earth. It's just a matter of time till we figure out how to get this to happen. That's the way that a lot of people on this Earth feel. Now, I can see some of you smiling, just barely smiling like they're insane. And that's because you know they are insane. But what you don't know is that, let's see, what was that question? Why is it so easy to see how others are doing themselves harm, but so hard to see how I harm myself? Well, because you're not seeing that you are doing the same thing that they're doing, that you really do believe that things are going to get better. But of course, you're doing different things. That's what's going to make them better. The work teaches something different. This is a very unpopular system because it runs against the grain of our imagination. Mainline science takes the attitude that the Earth is inhabited, populated, that it's one point among the millions of galaxies, suns, and planets that supports life as we know it, as we have come to understand it. The highest form of life is man. And so mainline science takes this attitude that we are the only ones here. They're admitting lately that it's possible that there are other, you know, we have radio telescopes sending messages out there. Hello, if you're out there, contact us. Our number is 760 blah, 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 or whatever. But the whole idea is pretty absurd. Until Galileo's telescope was invented, the universe turned around our tiny Earth. For us, we were the center of the universe, and all of this all was swirling around us. We were the point, the center of everything, and everything else basically served us. The sun, the stars, the moon, they were all there for us. They were all there to remind us of something, or they were all there to light our path, or to do this, or to do that. But it was all about us. Galileo came along with the telescope, and he says, no, we're not the center. And this fact, when Earth's rotation was discovered, it was met with hatred and contempt. People didn't like that. The church told Galileo, either you recant what you've said, or we will kill you. Do you understand what I mean by hatred and contempt? When someone threatens to kill someone else, that is hatred. I know that we don't think it that way. We think, well, unless, of course, they deserve it. But the church thought that Galileo did deserve it for destroying the faith, for destroying the faith of millions of people. Okay, hundreds of thousands, whatever. So they thought that this guy, well, this guy has to be taken out. He's ruining life on this planet. He'll ruin everything that really matters over this stupid thing that doesn't even matter. Because we've said this, now he's going to say something else, and we've got to stop that. Or else people will stop believing in us. And if they stop believing in us, they're going to stop believing in what we're selling. People felt that they were the most important thing. Everything else served us. So I have a question. Is this 
wrong attitude. You don't need to answer this out loud, but just answer to yourself. Is this a wrong attitude? Is this vanity? Is this egotism? Is this a right attitude or a wrong attitude? Is it that the whole universe serves us? Or is it that perhaps among all of this vast universe that we can't even fathom mentally, we cannot even conceptualize because we understand that the universe is expanding right now at this moment. It is expanding. It's growing. It's expanding outward. We can't even calculate how many light years it would take to get from here to there because we don't know where there is yet. So we don't really know. We know that the Milky Way, which is this huge galaxy with billions of suns of different sizes, and that we, our sun, is one of those little pinpoints of light in just the Milky Way. And there are millions of galaxies in the universe. And we're just one of them. And there are billions of suns, and ours is just one of them. And then there's this little planet here called Earth, and we're this speck in this whole universe. And then there's us, not even ants crawling around on the Earth, really. Look at it, you know, in scale. The work teaches that we're almost insignificant, unimportant. If the Earth blew up, it wouldn't even be noticed in the big scheme of things. This is offensive to us. This is, what do you mean? But, 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 but what about me and what about my possibilities? What about my potential? I mean, that's got to count for something. No, actually, it really doesn't. That whole idea is offensive to something in us. Just in case you're observing yourself, you may be noticing that. If you're not, then you're probably happily going along contradicting me, saying, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Which, of course, you're right. I haven't a clue what I'm talking about. This work, Esoteric Teachings, connect man with the universe in which he appears. We are not separate. We are connected with the universe in which we appear, according to this system. So really, I don't know what I'm talking about. That's just, this is true confession time. I don't know what I'm talking about. But the thing is, is, does this system know what it's talking about? Does this work know what it's talking about? Does it come from outside of our normal stockpot? Do these ideas come from outside of our stockpot? And if they do, can they lead us outside of our stockpot? This is really what this work is based on. To study man apart from the universe can't give us right emotions. Nothing is in man that isn't in the universe. These statements are familiar to you. Microcosm, macrocosm, as above, so below. These are all things that, that are code in the work for. It's all connected. It's in you, it's, it's, and you're in it. It's this big, unified, connected, organic whole. Now, we may not see it that way because our level of being prevents us from seeing that. But it is that way. And in higher moments, in better moments, you do see more of that than in other moments when you see less of that. There are some times when you see yourself as the whole world is against you. Then there are other times when you've seen yourself as part of the whole thing and it's all fine. Unfortunately, those become dreams for us, the myths, the legends, the beliefs, because we spend so little time actually in those higher states that they soon become just ideas. So as the sun is greater than the earth, and the earth is greater than the moon, there are also psychological levels, lower and higher, lesser and greater, in man, representing those outer beings. You see, this system looks at the earth and the moon and the sun as beings, as actual living beings that are taking in energy and putting out waste, that are interacting with one another, and Actually, they are. They have a certain nature. The nature of the sun is different than the nature of the earth. If the nature of the earth was the nature of the sun, we wouldn't be here because the temperature would be what? Well, hot. If the nature of the earth were the nature of the moon, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here because we'd freeze to death. There would be no water. We wouldn't be here. We couldn't exist. So the being of each of those planets is different. Each of those spheres is different. And this is the way the work looks at it. We don't. We don't have that kind of consciousness to look at it that way. The work also says that pride and vanity are two giants that keep us asleep, but also walk in front of us, making sure that everything is arranged according to the way they would arrange it before we ever get there. What this boils down to, for those of us who have observed ourselves with any regularity, what this boils down to is that pride and vanity are two giants that keep us asleep and walk in front of us, ruining our life. So that by the time we get there, there is nothing for us. It's already been ruined. We can't go to anything fresh and get a fresh impression because pride and vanity have destroyed everything, have put it in some other sick, twisted, polluted order to serve themselves, but not to serve us at all. 
someone who admires himself. Is he asleep? Well, I, you know, I don't know. And, you know, there's some people who admire themselves, but, you know, they're pretty admirable. You know? So maybe they're not as asleep as maybe some people who, like, admire themselves, and there's nothing admirable about them. They're more asleep. So we'll agree that there are degrees of sleep. But someone who admires himself, is he asleep? Well, yes. If you were scientifically convinced that only the Earth is peopled, that all else in this vast universe is dead matter, would it help you deal with the giants, pride and vanity? No. But for the most part, our leaders are pretty much convinced that that's the way it is. Well, the Earth is the only place there's life. Everything else is just dead matter. Are they asleep? Yeah, I hope so. I hope there's nowhere you can wake up, and that's the way life is. Waking up, things should get better, not get worse. Sometimes we look at the stars, the sun, the moon. We look out there on some special night, and all of a sudden, you are struck, wonderstruck, awestruck, and you feel your insignificance your smallness, your nothingness. You look at it all and you go, whoa. And it stops you. And you hang by a thread, suspended in this universe, suspended in time, where you, for a moment, see your relation to everything, which is, uh, uh, that's it. Oh my God, look at that. And maybe a tear comes to your eye when you realize the vastness of it all, the hugeness of it all, and your insignificance in the face of it all. Science should have increased our sense of wonder. Just like going out on that starry night and looking up and going, oh my God. I remember one time I was out in the desert, sleeping out in the desert, and I was sleeping without a tent, just on the ground with a sleeping bag. And all of a sudden I felt this. I mean, I just woke, woke up, just for no reason whatsoever, just boom, woke up. And as I woke up, I thought, oh, it's daylight. And I looked up, and it wasn't up. I mean, up. So I looked out from my nose, out from my eyes, and I saw the Milky Way. And up there in the desert, I was in the high desert, up there in the desert, it was so clear. It was so huge. It was so bright that the Milky Way was a blanket on my face. I mean, it was actually right there. It was like my hand in front of my face, two inches away from my face. And I was struck. I mean, obviously, you can tell. I remember this like it had just happened. So I was struck into awake. I was struck into being awake. I was, I was jolted into actually being awake for a moment, where the Milky Way was this living thing that I was a part of, and it was right there. And it was so bright. I couldn't believe it. I've never seen anything like it. I was filled with wonder. Science should have increased our sense of wonder just like that. Instead, it's done the reverse. Its message is everything is meaningless. But when you're filled with a sense of wonder, everything has meaning. Everything has meaning. <gasps> Look at the leaf. The leaf's dead. But no, it's not. Look at it. Look at the colors. Look, they're little insects. They're bacteria on it. It's like a whole universe. Yeah, well, you're just whacked out. You keep talking like that, they're going to throw a net over you. What does that mean? You keep talking like that, they're going to throw a net over you. It means science says, no, that's all dead matter. Yeah, that's just the way that is. Right, there's other things that are eating, but so what? You're all that matters. Isn't that the message that science gives us? Isn't that why scientifically, you think about the Manhattan Project back in the 40s, during the Second World War, it was a secret project to develop an atomic bomb. And the scientists who were working on it knew what it was going to be used for. And they all said, oh, I hope they don't do that. Oh, I hope they don't use that on people. They all knew exactly what was going to happen. They kept on working on it and then lived out however many years after that regretting what they'd done. And I mean seriously regretting it. There were guys who just like, oh, that was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Putting something like that in the hands of politicians was the dumbest thing that a human being could do. Science has failed. This decrease in meaning and understanding is evident everywhere. We've lost the emotions necessary for right development. You don't have them. Mm -hmm. You cannot develop what you need to develop to get into higher levels of being because you don't have the emotions for it. Patty said to me last night, she said, I had a moment when I was studying this food octave where I realized that I was food, that I was food, that I am food. She said, and all of a sudden I had this incredible compassion for cows. I thought, oh my God, we raise them for food. That's it. They're nothing but food for us. They're living creatures, sentient beings who have an awareness of their own existence and we are using them for food. That's like something using me for food. But science tells us, oh no, it's very different. We have no emotions about it, but she had an emotion. Now, it wasn't a very pleasant emotion because it was the realization of I'm doing this. I'm living in a culture where this is not only common, it's encouraged, and you're a freak if you don't. The first time I became a vegetarian was back in the 60s. And in the 60s, it was okay because, you know, there was the, like 
the hippies. And so it was okay. But then I became a vegetarian really seriously then back in the 70s where I had this same kind of thing. I was out taking pictures, photographs. It was in Kansas City, out in the outskirts of Kansas City, out in farmland. And there was this calf, you know, and I had this zoom lens and I'd zoomed in on the face of this calf. And just as I snapped the picture, you know, the calf looked at me, which is one of those moments, you know, and you know, they had those calf eyes that speak to you. If you're listening, you know, if you're not, if you just, look, eh, just come here, uh, hamburger, you know, we named our calf hamburger. We named our calf steak. Obviously, that's a totally different consciousness. That's not the one I was in. I wasn't in the hamburger consciousness. I was in some other place where this was a living being and there was a kinship with the very fact that it had life and I had life, that we were both sharing air, that we were both sharing water, that we were both sharing the sun, that we were both sharing a space on this planet, that it had a right to be there just as much as I did. And in my head, I heard, as I snapped the picture and saw these eyes, you mean you would eat me? I became a vegetarian that day and seriously became a vegetarian that day. My answer was no, I would not. I knew I could live just fine without doing that. So I thought, no, I would not. It doesn't threaten my survival at all. This does not threaten my survival one little bit to give this to life, to nod my head to life and say, okay, you're a living being, you have a right to be here. Totally different state of consciousness. There were times when I could not maintain that state of consciousness. I religiously did not eat meat, but it wasn't for the same reason. It was because I'm self-disciplined and that's what I do. Because I knew that eventually I'd get back to that state of consciousness, so I just stayed there. The emotions necessary for that were present for me then. They didn't remain present, but the act itself remained present. The duty. I'd set out to do something, so I would do it. And I had enough self-discipline to be able to do it. These emotions make man feel he's a very small creature. When we feel we're very small creatures, when we feel our insignificance, when we feel our place in this universe, our place of unimportance and insignificance, when we really feel that, it opens us up to higher centers. We can't have that when we're the other way. The other way doesn't open us up. It shuts us down. It closes us down. It contracts us. It constricts us. It strangles us so that higher centers cannot reach us. The influence of higher centers does nothing for us. There's no place for it to fall. We become little dense dots instead of opened flowers. You look at a bud, a flower bud, a little tight flower bud. Oh, yeah, that's great. But a lot of them die just like that. But if it opens up, then it rains, and then you can see universes in the drops of water that land on the petals. You look in it, and the whole world is reflected. Yes, I was painting this morning before I got here. So I had the watercolors out, and I was painting. And Wow, look at that. Wow, look at that. Oh, this really needs to be punched up. Oh, I can blend this in here. So, yeah, I have that whole perspective. Now, we're the same way. We open up, unfold a little bit. We can collect a lot more higher influence. But when we're knotted up like a little bud, we don't collect anything at all. It's like rain on a walnut. It takes a lot of rain to get that walnut wet, that walnut shell wet at all, or to get to the inside. Today, man sees the solution to everything as lying outside of himself, not in self-change. What was our solution to the World Trade Centers being bombed? Oh, we need to change our attitude toward the rest of the world. We need to change how we're using oil. We need to change how we're relating to the people in the Middle East. That was our first thought, right? Well, we need to change. No. Our first thought was, kill them all! How dare they? What arrogance. What incredible arrogance. Think about it. Is that a high level of being or is that a low level of being? Is that pride, vanity, egotism? Or is that someone who realizes their insignificance? that they've got to get along on this planet just like everybody else. What is our solution? Making more machines to do for us rather than increase our own consciousness. We just know that if we have better machines, that we can get those other people in line and make them do what they're supposed to do. Not what we want them to do, what they're supposed to do. It's not about us. It's about the whole planet. That's our lie. It's the lie we tell. The United Nations. What is the United Nations? It's five bully nations who tell the rest of the world what's going to happen. Is it five? China, the U.S., Russia, Great Britain, France. Okay, so there's five or six. Anyhow, there's just these bully nations that won a couple wars, that beat everybody else into submission, that used the atomic bomb faster and more than anybody else, and got more of them to develop, and beat everybody else into submission, and now tells them what they're going to do. And they say that we're going to have world peace. I know, this is just a terrible thing to be saying right now. And this is not political. I don't really care. 
I don't care what they do because I'm not looking at it like the U.S. or this or that. I'm looking at it like, look, this is our planet. These are our people. This is our earth. This is our chance. We have to change. You have to change. I have to change. I have to change my consciousness so that I am not running over everything in life because I think that I'm better, bigger, and more important than everything else in life. I've got to get my insignificance. I've got to get my place in the universe situated in scale and understand I have a lot of work to do on me before I can live there permanently. Either the machines are going to do it or we're going to increase our consciousness and our understanding. Look at it. Man is at war with machines today, and machines are at war with man. Machines are killing us. They're poisoning our air. They're poisoning our water. They're poisoning our earth. The machines you drove here in are poisoning all of those things. Try and get you away from that thing, though. The very thing that's killing you. <laughs> no! You can't take away my car! No, that's true. I can't take away your car. But if I could raise your consciousness, you'd give it up. No, I wouldn't! <laughs> okay, then don't raise your consciousness. I don't care. That's your business. That's your consciousness. You're trying to take cows away from me, hamburgers away from me. No, I'm not. I'm trying to get you to see that there is a need in you to raise your level of being or else none of this is going to make any sense. That's what this work is about. Man's characteristic, just like the characteristic of a dog or a cat, the being of a dog, the being of a cat, the being of a bird. We know birds fly, they have feathers. We know they have little reptilian kind of feet, skin covered feet. We know certain things about them. They make certain noises, they act certain ways. Dogs, they make certain noises, they act certain ways. Cats, they make certain noises, they make certain... Man is like that too. Man has a level of being that is characterized by things. What is it that characterizes man's level of being? Violence. It's the one thing that characterizes our current level of being and our level of being on this planet for all of history. For all of recorded history, the one thing that characterizes our level of being is violence. We will crack anybody's head wide open who doesn't do what we want and agree with us. That's our characteristic. Lack of understanding and the lack of self-observation keeps us busy with new destructive machines while we look for the UN and peace talks to make a difference. It's a joke. You know it's a joke. I know it's a joke in a moment of awareness. No, we don't know it's a joke the rest of the time because we're sound asleep. Oh no, they're really trying. Yeah. Look, if somebody comes along, say, take the biggest guy here, Steve. How tall are you? Six foot. Six foot. One. Six one. How much do you weigh? About 270. Six one, 270. He's a big boy. Say somebody comes along and he's 10 foot six and he weighs 565 pounds and he's pure muscle and he picks Steve up by the head and he says, okay, here's the way it's going to be. You're going to do what I want. I'm going to squash your head like a grape. If Steve has any kind of consciousness at all, he's going to say, sure, what do you want? Peace talks are not difficult. Steve will make peace the moment it's important to him. And so will we. And the reason we don't is because it's not important to us. And the reason it's not important to us is because our magnificence, our pride and our vanity go before us and ruin everything. That's what's important to us. This lack of consciousness, this inability to see contradictions in ourselves, is a sign of nothing more than our level of being. We lack consciousness of ourselves. We lack consciousness of who we are, what we're doing. It's a sign of our level of being. The object of this work is to increase consciousness, to see what you're like for yourself, so that you can penetrate the dark side beyond the pretense of false personality. That's it. That's the purpose of this work. At our present level of being, it's impossible to stop war. Absolutely impossible. Humanity attracts war due to its level of being. When you and I act like we're acting, War is inevitable. When you and I, meaning myself and the rest of this world, the people on this planet, act the way we act, war is inevitable. There's no other way. We cannot even drive from here to the grocery store without wanting to kill somebody in a car. Road rage. 80 million incidents of road rage reported per year. Is that what it is in the U.S.? Something like that. Crazy, crazy statistics. That's reported. I don't know. How many, how many have you not reported? Everyone. I've never reported one. I've never called anybody up and said, some guy was mad at me on the freeway. I mean, that just seems a little dumb. <laughs> you know, call 911. Oh, somebody tried to kill me on the freeway. Well, you stay off the freeway, you dummy. That's what people do because that's our level of being. Violence. It's characterized by violence. Get out of my way. You have no right to be in my lane. He cut in front of me. He's going slow in front of me. Doesn't he know I want to go faster? Why doesn't he move over? Why doesn't he just die? Yeah, why doesn't he just die? That's our level of being, folks. 
Man can't do. Everything happens the only possible way that it can. If mankind awoke from sleep, everything would be different. Everything would go entirely differently if mankind awoke from sleep. But that's not going to happen because life is keeping us asleep with the hypnotism of life because life has a different purpose for us. This pain factory called Earth is to grind out suffering and pain and grief because it's food for something else. Something else eats that. Something else lives off of that energy. Well, how come I don't know about that? <laughs> because you're stupid. The bottom line, because your level of being is such that it doesn't occur to you. That's why, well, it couldn't be. How could I be, how could I be put here just to, just to suffer so that something else could eat? Yeah, pride and vanity, the two giants, keep us asleep, go before us, ruining everything. I'm so wonderful. I couldn't be used for that. I'm much greater than that. We're insane. If we woke up, we'd become more conscious. Our level of being would change and another order of things would be attractive, war would cease. This makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If we woke up, our level of being would change. Yes, our level of being would change. Things would be different. Another order of things would be attracted to us. Look, when you're driving a Volkswagen, isn't it amazing how many Volkswagens are on the street? It's like, oh, wow, I never know that many Volkswagens. Or when you're, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, whenever your consciousness is opened up in a certain area, you notice it everywhere. Another order of things is attracted to you. You know, how many people join sports car clubs who don't have sports cars? Well, not very many. They usually have a sports car. And the Miata owners usually have a Miata, and they join the Miata owners club. And then the people with the Corvettes, they usually go to the Corvette. The guys who ride Harleys, they usually go to the Harley clubs. Isn't that how it works? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because your consciousness attracts what happens, what you're going to do, what happens in your life, the whole order of things. War would cease. At higher levels, we cease to be violent. Our general level of being is characterized by lying, making real agreement impossible. Look, our level of being is characterized by lying. We lie. We lie to ourselves, we lie to everyone else. Our entire life, for the most part, is a facade, a pretense of lying to make other people think something about us that isn't true, that we know isn't true. But we don't want them to know. We talked about this last week, the room where we hide things if some visitor comes up the drive. It all fits, as if I was actually ever talking about anything different. Nothing is what it pretends to be. Look in the animal kingdom. You ever see a cat get in a cat fight? What do they do? They arch their back. Their tail looks like a bottle brush. They hiss. They open their mouth as wide as they can. They make all the noise they can. They arch themselves, turn sideways, and look as big as they can, the biggest profile they can. Why? They're pretending to be bigger than they actually are and fiercer than they actually are because they're afraid, and that's how they compensate for their small size, for their insignificance. They pretend to be something else. All of life is pretending to be something. My question is, begin with yourself. When we speak, we lie, usually. Are you really what you pretend to be? Are you what you pretend to be? You know, these are questions you need to answer yourself. All negative states are due to lies and produce only lies. We forget very easily. It's impossible for everyone to be more conscious. Look, you've been in this work long enough to know it's nearly impossible for you to be conscious, to be more conscious. And you're working hard at it compared to the people you know in life. Compared to what you need to be doing, you're on a cruise, a vacation. But that's only because we don't have the emotions necessary to work toward a higher level of being. We just don't have the emotional valuation yet. We don't see our insignificance, so we lack the emotion necessary to do the work that needs to be done. Since man's level of being is the same as it was, everything will go on the only possible way that it can at the level, and no one will be able to do anything. News reruns. Until man's level of being changes, there's no new news, people. We're just going to change the names. We're going to change the names of the countries. When I was in school, I didn't want to learn geography because I said, well, what's the point? They'll change it. Gurdjieff said, everything is dependent on everything else. Everything is connected. Nothing is separate. Therefore, everything is going in the only way it can go. If people were different, everything would be different. They are what they are. So everything is as it is. If you want anything in life to be different, you must be different. You must change your level of being. Nothing anywhere is ever going to change until you change your level of being. When you've changed your level of being, the entire universe will be different. Maybe not a lot different, but maybe so different that you no longer fit here. I don't know. But this is why we work, to change our level of being, because this is the only way 
that any esoteric teaching has ever laid out for man to improve, for things to improve. The only way that things will improve is if man improves.